shot effect. Let's look at another one-dimensional collision example. Uh, the interesting thing about this problem is that we have object 1 and 2. And object 2 is attached to a light ideal spring, massless spring. And so when object 1 collides with object 2, it doesn't really touch object 2 directly. It touches the spring that's connected to object 1. So it's going to compress the spring. Okay, that's, you know, so we start with this initial state and that's during the collision. And after the collision, of course, uh, these two separate against the spring gets decompressed. Let's analyze this process. First of all, from conservation of momentum point of view, does the presence of the spring change the conservation of linear momentum? Well, don't forget the spring is part of object 2. If I consider object 1 and 2 as a single system, what does the spring do? Well, the spring is part of the system. Whatever it does, the force, whatever the force it gives to object 1 and 2, it remains internal, right? So if you ob consider object 1 and 2 as a single system, the momentum conservation still holds true, unless, of course, you consider some friction from the floor, which we, pr we, we, we say does not exist. So you still can con use conservation of linear momentum for every moment of the collision. That's good. What about conservation of energy? Okay. Let's be more careful here. We have always talked about conservation of kinetic energy. That is because we never had something like a spring in between. Okay, now what if you had a spring? Well, let's consider that. This guy comes in. Initially, they're moving to, uh, in the opposite direction, the way I draw it. So the spring inevitably gets, gets compressed. Okay, because one guy want to go this way, the other one want to go that way. So it gets compressed. It gets compressed and compressed. When the spring gets compressed, part of the kinetic energies of carried, uh, carried by these two guys will be converted to potential energy okay but since that's the elastic potential energy of the spring but since the force of the spring is a conservative force whatever work you do against that force of the spring is not wasted rather it gets stored as the potential energy in this case it's a temporary situation because the energy stored as potential form is totally released once the collision is over the spring is no longer compressed right it's it's completely decompressed, so all the potential energy that's stored on the spring gets released back. So, if you go from this initial state to the final state, you find that as a result, the spring does not really retain any energy at the, at the end of the day, and therefore, you also have conservation of kinetic energy between the initial state and the final state. And therefore, whether there is a spring or not, you still have the same exact V1 final and V2 final as we calculated before for one dimensional completely elastic collision. So in this sense, this problem is nothing new. However, it is interesting to look at what happens in the middle of the collision. You see, in the middle of the collision, let's assume okay, that this guy has far greater velocity than that one. So it carries more momentum. Okay, it carries more momentum. So it's going to make an impact to the spring getting it compressed, and this, this other mass, will of course, will also want to try to come in, right? So it's going to compress the spring. So the spring keeps on getting compressed, but that doesn't go on forever. At some point, the spring will have a maximum compression, and after that, they're going to go the separate ways, and the spring gets decompressed. What I'm interested in is the precise moment in the, in the midst of the collision where the spring gets a maximum amount of compression. Maximum amount of compression. What is the maximum compression xm of the spring during the, the collision. This is what I want to know. How do I do that? Well, first of all, we realize that the presence of the spring does not change the linear momentum of the two objects. I can always use conservation of linear momentum. Okay, so that's, that's clear. That, however, only gives me one equation. I have more than one unknown to figure out. One is, of course, the amount of compression. But secondly, you have to know at that moment how fast are these two guys moving, right? Conservation of momentum gives you only one equation. So here's the thing. Let's look at what happens when a spring gets compressed. You know, the spring has a head and a tail. These points, this head and tail, they can both move, OK? If they move in opposite direction, what happens to the spring? It gets longer, right? If they move in, if they're moving like this, not flying away from each other, then the spring gets compressed, okay? The spring gets compressed. 
What I want to know is the moment when the spring gets maximum compression. What happens? You know, initially, let's say this is, has far greater velocity than that, just, just you know, for the sake of argument. It comes in, so it's like this, right? It comes, it's like this. And this second guy comes in like that. Uh, so this guy compresses the, the head more than this guy compresses the tail. And if, uh, you know, eventually, this guy's going to slow down. That one is not only going to slow down, probably going to reverse direction. So what happens is that you're going to slow down a bit. This is going to slow down a bit. But if they're still moving towards each other, the spring keeps on getting compressed. Okay? When, does the spring, when is the spring not getting compressed? Is when they are moving in the same direction. Not only are they moving in the same direction, they have the same exact velocity. You see, if they have the same exact velocity, what does that tell you? The head and the tail of the spring moves completely with the same velocity, so therefore the length of the spring at that moment does not change. Right? And after that, of course, the spring is going to, uh, you know, the two objects are going to separate, and the spring will get even longer. So what does that tell you? The moment when the spring has maximum compression, is when these two guys move at exactly the same velocity. Okay? After that, this guy not only is going to reverse, going to, but it's going to speed away. It's going to go faster. That one is probably going to slow down or even reverse backwards. So eventually, the spring is fully decompressed. This is a crucial observation that you must have in mind. The speed of object one and two, the velocity actually, to be more precise, are exactly equal to each other at the moment of maximum compression, only at that moment. Okay, so we can now have conservation of momentum with a common speed, common velocity at that moment. Now, remember, that doesn't mean it's a complete inelastic collision, okay? Because the energy, the kinetic energy that you momentarily lose is not wasted. It's stored in a kinetic, in, as, as an elastic potential energy. So, conservation of linear momentum for this, for this moment. I have M1 v1 initial plus m2 v2 initial equals for this moment they have the same exact speed which i call v okay so i have m1 plus m2 v this gives me an equation for v okay but doesn't give me an equation for x maximum so what's the second equation this is the conservation of energy what's the second equation conservation of energy of course mechanical energy including don't forget the potential energy stored on the spring. Okay, you see, these two guys are going to lose some kinetic energy for the time being, before being restored. But that energy lost is now stored on the uh, spring. So we have initial kinetic energy, initial kinetic energy of, of both of them. That's one half uh, m1 v1 squared, v initial squared plus one half m2 v2 initial squared. That equals the total mechanical energy at that moment, at that moment, including the kinetic and potential form. This guy's moving with speed v, so does that one. Okay, so we have one half at that moment, as far as the kinetic energy is concerned, and one plus m2 times a common v squared. Okay? But these are obviously not equal, because part of the energy has to get stored on the spring. So don't forget this extra potential energy term. 1 half k x maximum squared. There we go. We have enough equations now. The first equation will tell what v is, which is that v here. You plug in that v, you can solve for x maximum. Okay, so this is an example of a more general sense of elastic collision, and that is not only do we have to consider kinetic energy, we must also consider other forms of energies, like in this case, the, full, the energy stored on a spring that's momentarily uh, that momentarily takes away part of the kinetic energy, but it gives it back when the spring gets totally decompressed. And here is a famous example that you see in every textbook for this subject. It's called the ballistic pendulum. This is a device that can be used to find the speed of a bullet or a very fast moving object. You wonder how people did that, how people measured the speed of a bullet uh, before they invented high speed photography, you suppose? Well, actually, it's not all, not all that hard if you use this device called the ballistic pendulum. So what you see here is a massive object, okay, supported from the ceiling on two equal length strings. The string, 
let's say the length of each string is L. Okay, it's a massive object, object 2. And here is object 1, the bullet. It comes in, uh, it, it, it's fired horizontally into the block. And the block being so massive and so large, the uh, bullet doesn't quite penetrate it. It just stays inside, gets embedded. Okay, and of course, you know what happens next, right? Because the bullet gives an impact, so the thing starts to swing up like this. Okay, let's say the, it swings up to an angle theta from the vertical and it stops momentarily before it comes back. Okay, swings up to this angle and it starts to come back. It turns out that if I know everything else that can be measured easily, like the length of the string, the mass object of object one and two, and this angle, I can actually go back and figure out what the initial speed of the bullet is. That is the uh, effective use of the so-called ballistic pendulum. So how does it work, really? How does it work? Well, as a matter of fact, we need to, here's the key to this problem. We need to mentally divide this into three separate steps. One, two, and three, or A, B, and C. Why do we mentally divide it into three separate stages? Well, you see why. Stage one, let's first look at stage one. Stage one is when the bullet comes moving towards uh, the, the, the block and has not reached the block yet. That is our initial state. Okay, initial state, stage A. Stage B, the bullet has successfully uh, lodged into the, uh, the massive object and it has reached the exact same speed as this massive object. So it is no longer going forward relative to the, to, the, to the block anymore, they have reached a common speed, which is called VB. Okay, that's stage two. Stage three is when the whole thing, the bullet and the block together, swings upward, reaching this angle theta. So at that point, VC is zero. It momentarily stopped because it's just on its way back. So you have these three steps. Why are we mentally dividing them into three stages? It's because it turns out for each, for, for the whole process from A to B to C, nothing is conserved. You don't have conservation of mechanical energy. You don't have conservation of linear momentum. There's no conservation law to use. And yet, you know it's a collision problem. You, don't want, you, you want to exploit conservation laws, right? In order to exploit conservation laws, we have to divide it into these three stages, A, B, and C, and let's apply the appropriate conservation law to the appropriate stage. That is what we want to do. Okay, first of all, you go from stage A to stage B. In this case, you have a linear momentum. If you consider the bullet and block as a single system, the momentum is carried only by the block. I mean, sorry, only by the bullet. And the initial momentum is M1, V1, A. Right? Now, assuming that the block is so incredibly massive and the bullet is relatively light, so that when it fires in, it quickly gets embedded inside. So before, uh, even at the moment they reach the same final velocity, VB, the bullet and the block, this block being so massive has so much inertia, it has not really started going up significantly. So the strings remain vertical. Okay, you, so in, in, the, in this stage, you have a collision process between the bullet and the block. That is obviously a complete or perfect inelastic collision, right? Because as a result, they have the same exact velocity VB afterwards. But the key here is that during the collision, the two strings remain vertical. Now, why is that so important? Because a string can only give it a supporting force along it, like this. And that force is essentially vertical, because this, you know, the block has not started swinging up yet before that common velocity has been reached. Okay. You know, leaning moment is a vector. It has vertical and separate vertical and horizontal components. I'm looking at only the horizontal direction. In the horizontal direction, is there any external force exerted on the bullet and the block system during the collision? No, because the only external force that we can think of are supporting force from the string and the weight. Since the strings remain vertical for the brief moment of the collision, there is no horizontal external force. So you see, from stage A to stage B, 
I can use conservation of linear momentum in the horizontal direction. Can I not? Right? Of course, once the string starts to swing, swing up, the tension is now like that. There is a horizontal component of the tension. That tension, of course, is external. Then we lose conservation of momentum. Okay, but for the brief momentum collision, the strings remain vertical. I can use conservation of momentum. And that is what I'm going to do, which allows me to figure out what VB is, the common velocity of the bullet and the block right after the brief collision. So uh, to do so, let me we realize that momentum at this point is M1 plus M2 VB, right? Momentum before the collision, momentum right after the collision, and they are equal. That is the conservation of linear momentum. Now, once this is done, we go to from stage B to C. So what happens is that now, object 1 and 2 is considered as a single system now. It's a single object now with a mass of M1 plus M2. And what happens to, to it? Well, it starts out with kinetic energy because it's moving at speed Vb, right? And it swings as the string starts to swing sideways the whole object goes upwards, so therefore it has gained potential energy. And what does it lose? Kinetic energy, of course. So when the angle becomes theta, all the kinetic energy is gone, so the thing has stopped momentarily. All right? Okay, so from B to C, can we use conservation of linear momentum? Well, once again, we cannot, because again, these two tensions are now not only vertical, but they're partially vertical and partially horizontal so it's pulling the thing backwards therefore it's going to reduce the linear momentum of the system in the horizontal direction as a matter of fact isn't that obvious you have motion you have motion you have linear momentum but at that point c you have stopped you don't have any linear momentum somebody must have killed the linear momentum and who's doing that the tension of course of course not to mention gravity that's another factor so we cannot use conservation of linear momentum from b to c what can we use instead well, what's the other conservation law? That's the conservation of mechanical energy, right? What's the condition for the mechanical energy to be conserved? All forces doing work must be conservative. How many forces are doing work? Well, how many forces are there, external forces? Well, we have gravity. But that's a conservative force. We don't worry about it. We also have tension. Do we worry about the tension? Well, not really. Because the object, look at, look at the contact point. Each contact point is moving, is swinging in a circle like this. Okay, each is swinging in a circle. So the motion of the object is perpendicular to the direction of force. The force is really inward, the motion is tangential, so the tension doesn't do any work. So we don't care. And therefore, we can use conservation of mechanical energy from stage B to stage C. You can see why we mentally divide into A, B, and C. Because from A to B, we have conservation of linear momentum. And from B to C, we can have conservation of mechanical energy. Okay, only by dividing them into separate stages can we apply the appropriate conservation law that's, that works for each stage. Again, for the whole thing, going from A to C, nothing is conserved. Momentum is not conserved, energy is not conserved. So, going from B to C, let's see. Uh, basically, what you do, you trade all your kinetic energy for the final potential energy. Okay, the kinetic energy initially is one half. That's at point B, right? One half. M1 plus M2 VB squared. Okay, what is that equal to? At that point, all that kinetic energy is gone, but in return, you get potential energy. How much potential energy did you get? Well, let's see now. The contact point, this point and that point, it moved from here to there. It went up by distance H. Right? So, what's the kinetic, what's the potential energy gain? That's M1 plus M2 times G times H. Right? Now, what's H equal to, by the way? See, from here to there, that is the initial contact point right here, right? So, this lens is L. So is that lens. They're both equal to L. This is L. That is L. So, and how long is it from here to there? Isn't that L times cosine theta? Okay, so this is L. This is L cosine theta. So H is simply L minus L cosine theta. Okay, that's geometry. So you plug that in, right? 
the first equation will tell you what VB is. You solve for VB in terms of VA, V1A. And you plug that VB in here. You know what H is, because you know what theta is and L is. What did that tell you? You get an equation with only one unknown, that is V1A. That is the initial speed of the bullet. So solving that will give you the initial speed of the bullet, and that's how the ballistic pendulum works. So when you solve for this conservation of momentum and conservation of mechanical energy, you get this answer. Okay, eliminate VB and solve for V1A. This is the final, this is the initial speed of the bullet. All you need to do is measure the masses, measure the length of the string, measure the angle of final swing, and then you find the speed of the bullet. As a matter of fact, you can see here, if, uh, if the mass M1 is very, very small, so you have a tiny, tiny bullet, and yet it yielded the same angle of swing for the same length L, obviously it has to go very, very fast, right? Otherwise, how does it, how does a light, very light bullet makes that kind of impact? It must be very fast, even, and, and, and that's indeed true. You see, if M1 is very small, V1 must be very large, right? That makes perfect sense. So this is the uh, problem of ballistic pendulum.